you can go ahead and unmute that for questions. So in any case, um, thanks again for being on the call today, Tracy. Um, I want to let everybody know that uh, I met Tracy a few years ago, and she is a wonderful attorney. She's local here, and um, she lives in Peters Township, not far from me and not far from our current office. It's her office. Um, she's about 30 seconds away from my house. Um, I never noticed that she was there, and I think we were just introduced through um, another contact, but I've gotten to know her over the last few years, and she works, she's worked with a number of our clients and just does an excellent job in servicing them, but also has a great process in which she helps clients um, with various you know, estate planning issues. Primarily, she focuses on estate planning and administration, with most things being flat fee, but she does also do some other things as well. A couple of fun things about her, she works with her hubby, just like we do, so uh, we tend to have a lot in common there, and when we go to lunch or dinner, we have a lot of things to laugh about. Um, and whenever I went to Disney last year, I found out that Tracy is a Disney expert, and she, I don't know how, Tracy, how many times have you been to Disney? <laughs> I think right now, just three um, okay. in the last two years, and then our next one's January. Yes, but she's a wonderful Disney planner. So if you need any estate planning on the side, she helped me plan our Disney trip last year, which went very well as a result of her filling me in on how to go <laughs> about doing that in the best way. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Tracy, and she's going to be talking about estate planning for probably 20 minutes or so and pausing um, for questions um, in between, and then we'll leave additional time for Q&A. Um, she might go as long as 30. I think it just depends on um, what, what kind of questions come up in between. But I do really encourage you to ask specific questions because this is a really broad topic and she's very knowledgeable. So, Tracy, thank you so much for doing this today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it uh, over to you. No, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone and, um, you know, answer any questions that you might have about the topic of estate planning. Um, Melissa already gave you a little bit of background on me. Uh, and the first thing that I'd like to talk about is who needs an estate plan. And my opinion on that is that everybody needs something. Not everyone needs the same thing, but everyone needs something in place. Uh, and those pictures there are the reasons that I have an estate plan. Um, you know, I have kids, I'm married, I have a house, dogs things like that, and all of that can be covered through an estate plan. So when I use the word estate plan, what exactly does that mean? So um, with estate planning, the main three documents I typically talk about are a will, a financial power of attorney, and then a medical power of attorney, um, health care directive, living will, those are, those are kind of all tied into one. So those are the three types of documents that we'll be talking about today. And what I'll do is I'll go over one of the documents and then I'll unmute everyone. So if you have any questions about that specific document, then you can ask it um, then because I want to make sure that I'm you know, answering all the questions that you have. So the first document to talk about is a financial power of attorney. Your financial power of attorney is a document that is only valid while you're alive. And I think that's a really common misconception. A lot of people try to use a financial power of attorney after somebody passes away. But its sole purpose is for you to pick someone to name to make financial decisions for you if you're not able to, but you're still alive. So the second that someone passes away, that financial power of attorney ends, and then the executor of the will would take over at that point. So a financial power of attorney is where you pick someone to help you either pay your bills, um, access IRA money, um, sell a house if need be, sign any sort of financial documents. Um, that's the purpose of the financial power of attorney. Who you pick as your agent, and I'm sure Melissa has seen some horror stories with that, is you should pick someone that you trust uh, financially, because they're going to be someone that can access your accounts and spend your money, and sometimes that's not necessarily in your best interest. So you want to make sure you trust the person um, from a financial standpoint um, for who you're picking. 
And there's two different types of power, financial powers of attorney, an immediate and a springing. So the immediate essentially is the second that you sign that document, your agent, the person that you've selected, can make financial decisions for you, even if you're not incapacitated. So you see that a lot with spouses, especially if one's maybe traveling, then that spouse can sign, a, you know, maybe close on a house or do something like that without the other spouse being present. Um, springing means that it only comes to life should you be um, incapacitated and no longer able to make financial decisions for you. Now, there's a lot of pros and cons to doing a springing versus immediate. So for the springing, obviously, if you have a document floating around there, it cannot be used unless it's been certified that you've been incapacitated or that you are incapacitated. The pro to that is that, you know, you're protected while you're not incapacitated and no one can essentially like sell your house that's out from underneath you. The con to that is that it adds a little bit of red tape for your family if you do become incapacitated because they would need a doctor's note saying that you aren't able to make decisions and I've had some situations where if it is a little gray, the doctors are unwilling to sign that the person's not able to make decisions, even though they might be in the hospital or something, and it makes it really hard for them to uh, sign, you know, sign the documents. Or, I mean, pay the bills or sign any documents that need to. So, um, you know, that's something to talk about if you're ever looking at a financial power of attorney is which one's the best for you. And there's really no right answer. I think it's different for each person. So then before we go on to then the next one, the healthcare power of attorney, uh, I'm gonna unmute and if anybody has any specific questions about the financial document, um, that would be great if you wanna ask. Anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Uh, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, is there such a thing as just a strictly spousal financial power of attorney? Yes, what some attorneys will do is if that's something you're looking for, you could, have, you could have a power of attorney where just the spouse is named and you don't have a backup. The concern with that would be if your spouse is not able to make decisions, the alternative if you don't have a power of attorney in place is that your family has to go through a guardianship through the court in order to have somebody appointed through the courts to be the power of attorney. So it can be very costly for the family if there isn't a power of, if there is not a power of attorney in place. Um, so depending on the circumstances, like I always talk to everyone about their individual circumstances on whether or not it would be beneficial to have that backup in place. But yes, you can just have a specific power of attorney just for spouses. And, and someone could be added later, or it, would that just be a whole new power of attorney? With technology now, with, um, you know, a lot of stuff just being in Word documents, I always recommend just add the person later because it's not, you know, a significant charge because it's not like we're typing it up the document in a typewriter. Again, we're just adding the person's name and you're just re-signing the document, which would make it a lot easier for the banks and they would accept it a lot quicker. Um, if you do it that way versus having some sort of amendment. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is there another question too that I heard? Well, that was me, Tracy. Of course, you know me, I always have a question. I guess I pose this for the benefit of other clients. Sometimes people tell me that an attorney told them they don't need a power of attorney or it's not a big deal if they don't have one. Um, and I don't really understand that thinking, so maybe you could comment on that. And then secondly, um, I do run into people who say they, they aren't sure who to make their power of because maybe they don't have someone that they trust. Yeah. Are there ways, how can somebody be protected um, so if they do appoint someone, like a friend or someone that's maybe a little bit more distant and they're a little worried about 
you know, the fact that they think they trust them, but they're not sure. Are there, how would they be protected if the power of attorney was abusing their powers? So that's the hard part about the powers of attorney is that unless you have someone looking out for your interests, um, there's a lot of fraud that comes with powers of attorney. So that's why it's so important to pick someone that you do trust. Um, if it is a more distant relative or a friend, I always recommend doing the springing power of attorney where it essentially only comes becomes effective if you are incapacitated. Because at that point, it's probably, you know, it's better than having nothing at all. If you don't have someone that you trust, though, there are companies out there that will serve as a power of attorney um, that, you know, they get paid for their services. They're just a corporation that that's their job. Um, so there are options if you don't have, a you know, a, a person close to you that you would be comfortable naming. Um, I hear a lot, too, with your first question on comments of, well, I've heard I don't need one. Um, and I would definitely be very interested to talk to the attorneys that say that because, I mean, my thoughts are more, if you're going to not have a document, maybe the will would be the one not to have because Pennsylvania law essentially writes a will for you if you don't have one. If you don't have a power of attorney in place, then you have to go through a guardianship with the courts. So a power of attorney is usually a couple hundred dollars. A guardianship could be $5,000 to go through the courts because you have to petition the court to become appointed as the guardian for the person that's incapacitated. You have to go before a judge. You have to get a medical expert report from a doctor that they certify that the person is incapacitated. There's a hearing involved. There's a lot of court filings and reportings every year with the court on, you know, what's happening with the money and things like that. So it's definitely a very long process. Um, and I've seen a lot of families struggle with that when they need a guardianship because they can't get access to money that they need to maybe pay for, you know, their mom and dad's care or something like that, um, where if they would have just had a financial power of attorney, it would have all been avoided. So I would say, like, mine would be the exact opposite where, the one, the document that I personally think is the most important is the financial power of attorney. Um, and then maybe probably medical would be second to that. Thanks, Tracy. That's really helpful. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions on the financial powers of attorney? All right. Well, then I will mute again and then we'll go on to the healthcare. So with the healthcare power of attorney in the living will, um, this is a document very similar to the financial power of attorney where you pick someone to make medical decisions for you if you're not able to. And one thing to point out with that is your financial person, so the person that's good with money and making your financial decisions can be different than your medical person. They don't have to be the same person because that's always a question that I get. So on this case, you want to name someone that you think is going to follow your wishes for what you you would want if you were considered um, in some sort of incapacitated state where you cannot make can make decisions for yourself. So a healthcare power of attorney, the way I draft my documents, they're broken into two parts. The first part covers situations where you might be in some sort of end stage condition, or sorry, you might be not in an end stage condition, but you're still unable to make decisions. So let's say you're on a ventilator, you're in a coma, but you're expected to recover. Your healthcare person, agent, would be able to make decisions that come up. The second part of the document is a living will, and the living will covers the end stage decisions. So if you're in hospice, you can no longer communicate, what do you want to happen? Do you want tube feedings? Do you consent to donate your organs? Do you want to be resuscitated? Um, or do you just want some sort of comfort measures? So those would be the decisions that you would make with a healthcare power of attorney. And why I say I think healthcare documents are like the second most important if I was really trying to um, prioritize documents is this one is where you tell your family what you want if you were um, at the end of your, you know, end of your life, what you would want to happen. Um, a lot of times a doctor will 
you know, if there's an emergent situation, a doctor does not require a health care power of attorney, but then you better hope that the entire family is in the same um is on the same page as far as decisions. Because where you run into issues and then you end up in court and all of that is if you have family members that have different decisions on what should happen. So all of that would be avoided if you have that health care power of attorney in place. All right, so any questions about the healthcare documents? This is Rich again. Hi, Rich. So there's a difference between the living will and a healthcare power of attorney. Yes, it's almost like two documents in one. But typically, you have the same person making those decisions. I don't recommend that you have two different people because then there's a question as to at what point does the other person take over. So typically, you have that same person making decisions. So that person would make any decisions, like let's say you're in a coma, but you're expected to recover. Decisions about your medical care need to be made. That person would make those decisions. But then you also provide guidance. So that's the second part of the document, the living will. You provide these terms and um, on what you would want to happen if you were considered end stage. And and the living the living will, uh, we, you just can get those forms at a doctor's office or hospital. But the health care power of attorney is a legal notarized document. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, they're actually both legal documents. If you're looking for the health care power of attorney document to see like a sample and one that's been um, approved, the Allegheny County Bar Association has that document on their website. Basically, a bunch of attorneys and a bunch of doctors got in the same room and decided like, you know, they fought out essentially what is legal, what is medical, and what does everybody agree on, and they came up with a health care power of attorney and living will. And that is on the Allegheny County Bar website. Um, I believe it's right – it's very easy to find if you're on that website, um, and you can actually download it and sign it and have um, a health care power of attorney, you know, ready to go if you need one. And I've had clients that, you know, if they have a medical appointment or something um, and they don't have time to sit down and go through with an attorney, they will use that as a, a quick document to have something in place. Okay, and, then, and, and that does not have to be notarized or anything then? No, I would recommend that you get it notarized and witness because that just further validates that there's no question about your capacity when you signed or anything like that, but it is not legally required to be notarized. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions about this document? All right. Well, let's move on to the will. Oh. And then we touched already on if you don't have a power of attorney, you have to go through that guardianship. So your last will and testament, that is a document that only comes into play when you pass away. And one of the biggest confusions with a will is that people think that it covers all of your assets, and it does not. It only covers assets that are solely in your name without a beneficiary designation. So if you have your IRA with Melissa and there's a beneficiary on that, whoever is named as the beneficiary would get that IRA. Same with life insurance. Whoever's on that life insurance policy gets that IRA. If you have a brokerage account that has a transfer on death designation, whoever it transfers to gets that brokerage account. So the will would only cover then assets that are solely in your name. Um, for spouses, if items are jointly titled, typically your will would come into play after the second spouse passes away. Because when the first spouse passes, everything typically goes to the, automatically to the surviving spouse because it's jointly titled, and then it becomes solely in that person's name and would then pass through the will. So assets that you typically see pass through your will are your house, bank accounts. If you have stock with a company, um, if you own a business solely in your name, those are the assets that you would see go through your will. 
The nice thing about a will is you can be pretty customized with what you want um, to make sure that your wishes are, you know, followed and carried through. So there's three main parts to your will. The first is the tangible personal property. So that's like all of your household stuff, jewelry, furniture, things like that. Um, I always stress to my clients to not overlook the tangible property. In my experience with doing a lot of estate work, when someone passes away, the family, let's say there's two kids, they're not fighting over the $50,000 because $50,000 divided by two is 25000 and they each get 25000 It's really not that hard to figure that part out. What they do fight over is grandma's wedding ring or rosary beads or the family you know, photo albums and things like that. So what you can do is you can actually write out a list of things that you want certain people to get so that it'll avoid fighting in your family. And it's not necessarily the things of value either. So yeah, if you have, you know, a million dollar painting on the wall, that might be something that you want to determine who gets. Um, but it's really the sentimental things that people fight over because there is no actual monetary value to it. Um, and that's where I see a lot of uh, issues with the states. If families are going to fight, that's what they're going to fight over. You can also do a specific bequest. So that's basically saying if you want one of your, let's say you, want, you have a child that lives in your house and you want them to get the house, you can specifically give them certain items. If you want grandkids to get $100,000 to go into an education fund, you can do that. Um, and then the final part is the residuary. And that's basically the catch-all everything else. So after you've given all the way the tangible stuff, you've made any specific bequests that you have, basically anything else that's left over would then get divided in accordance with your wishes. And one question I always get is, oh, I bought a new house, I got a new bank account, I moved um, you know, banks or something like that, do I have to update my will? And the answer to that is no, unless that item was listed on a specific bequest. So if it's not and it just falls into the catch-all and you didn't specifically list it on your document, you don't have to update your document if you, um, you know, get a new house or something like that. So there's a lot of provisions that we can put into your will. Um, there's, we can put trust provisions, so if you want to protect against your kids divorcing spouses or your beneficiary might not be good with money and you want to put some provisions in place, we can do that. Uh, we can put language in there if somebody is receiving some sort of government benefits because they have special needs. We can put language in the will that would protect um, the government benefits. We can make sure that beneficiaries don't blow the money on a Ferrari or something like that and instead save it for something responsible. Uh, and then we can actually make provisions for your pets as well. Um, I have a lot of clients that you know have pets and they might have children, they might not have children, and they want to make sure that if something were to happen to them, their pets are taken care of. So you can really customize your will um, any way that you like. The main people that are typically named in a will is an executor. So the executor is the person that's going to handle the initial estate. So they, you know, maybe pay all the inheritance taxes, they transfer all the assets to the beneficiaries, and they kind of take the role of getting everything organized and distributed out. If you have a trustee also named to create a trust, then you would name your trustee in the document as well. That's the person that's going to manage the trust take care of the money, um, things like that. And then if you have minor children, you would name a guardian in your will to take care of any minor children. And the biggest thing that I see is it's just really important to have conversations with your advisors, with your family members, and everyone, so everyone's on the same page with your estate planning. If you work with an attorney and you do your estate planning, but then your attorney doesn't talk, it doesn't help you walk through the guidelines of your beneficiaries and things like that, then like Melissa might not know to update beneficiaries so that it now jives with your estate plan. So that's why it's important just to have those conversations and make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, any questions about, you know, the will? I know that's very basic. It's kind of high level on what
but I unmuted everyone. So if anyone has any questions about wills or powers of attorney, um, please let me know. Any questions, guys? I know there's probably questions because I get lots of questions about this stuff. Um, I think a question I get a lot um, is if I have a, a trust, do I need a will? So I, I hear a lot of questions, um, clients ask me that question. Maybe you could just touch on that. Yeah, so if you have a revocable trust, a lot of times what people will do is they might want to avoid probate, which I can preface is not terrible in Pennsylvania, so most people don't need a trust. Um, but if you have one, then I would recommend that you have a will because there's always an asset that for whatever reason is either forgotten about um, or honestly the more likely scenario sometimes is that if you have like let's say you die as a result of a personal injury or medical malpractice and your estate is the suing whoever, you know, was a, the cause of the death. If there are any proceeds from that litigation that passes through your will, it would not pass through the trust. So basically what your will says, though, is that if something didn't pass through the trust, treat it as if it did. So then it just makes sure everything just goes in accordance with your wishes. But one thing to think about, too, or one thing to know is that I get a lot of questions, too, and I, I know Melissa does, that um, how much do I need to have a trust because it saves me on taxes. And that really is, that typically is not true because, one, it depends on what tax you're talking about. Are you talking about Pennsylvania inheritance tax, income tax, um, federal estate tax? Because a lot of times what happens is that you create something to, so you'll save on one tax to then just incur another tax that might be even higher. So that's one thing to be careful about whenever you talk about taxes is understanding which tax you're actually talking about and does it really change or affect anything. Right, because there are income tax implications. There's a state tax and inheritance tax implications, right? There's capital yep. gains tax and yep. inheriting that's had different implications. So I think that people a lot, and they don't always understand. Like you said, they might avoid the estate tax and end up having to pay capital gains tax, right? Yes. Yeah. And I see that a lot when someone wants to transfer their house into their kids' names. Yep. So you end up typically paying, it's much better to inherit a property because you pay, yes, you pay Pennsylvania inheritance tax at 4.5%, but you avoid capital gains tax at 15%. So if you transfer it into your kids' names and then your kids go to sell it, then they're going to pay 15% cap 15 plus percent capital gains tax. Yeah. Maybe you could just tell us some of like the top three pitfalls you find like when people are writing these documents or like a will specifically, like the mistakes that people make or in Pennsylvania maybe just like the most common misconceptions or something? Um, so a lot of issues that I see are um, one big one is naming minors as a beneficiary. So if someone's, you know, filling out their life insurance forms that they got at work and they're, they name their kids as their contingent beneficiary, um, and a child cannot inherit in Pennsylvania until they're 18. So basically that money, if it got paid out before they were 18, sits in a, um, an account at the bank earning very little interest, and then it just gets turned over to them when they're 18. Um, so that's definitely a problem that I see. Um, I see outdated plans. So people, whenever the federal state tax was a lot lower, they maybe did their planning in the 90s, and they have these really complicated trusts that were very important back in the 90s whenever there were a lot of different tax consequences, but those tax consequences have been eliminated now, so you don't need that complex tr trust structure anymore. And then what I see is when that person passes away, the family actually incurs a lot of legal and tax fees because of those outdated plans. Um, 
Another issue I'm seeing recently is Pennsylvania changed the law in 2015 on financial powers of attorney. So all of those doc, if you have a financial power of attorney that's prior to 2015, it is supposed to be grandfathered in to, um, and banks are supposed to accept them. But I'm seeing now that it's been five years, they're starting to not accept them and they're saying that they want an updated power of attorney. Uh, and if the person that signed the power of attorney no longer can sign a new one, then they're having to get an attorney involved to you know, go to the banks to make sure that they accept it, where it would have been less expensive to just update the power of attorney while the person still had capacity. So I think those are like the big ones I see right now. Okay, thanks for that, that's helpful. Any other questions? Can you touch on probate? Sure, so probate is a process in Pennsylvania where um, either if someone has a will, it is authenticated and the executor is appointed to make, uh, to legally be able to make decisions on behalf of the estate. Um, or if there is no will, an administrator is selected and appointed to make those same decisions. Um, and probate's a process, so once that process is started, you have to legally advertise the estate to, find, um, to notify any creditors. You have to file a Pennsylvania inheritance tax return and report all the assets and pay the tax on that. There's an inventory that's filed, and then eventually, ultimately, at the end, the estate um, is closed once all the family members sign off on agreement that everything is good. So it's a process. Um, it gives authority to whomever is named as the executor administrator to access accounts. Like a lot of times if someone has a bank account that's solely in their name, that account will become frozen once the person dies and you have to open an estate in order to get access to that money. But like I said, it's not terrible in Pennsylvania. There's other states like New York and Florida that it's very, very costly. It's link, a lengthy process and um, you really don't see that in Pennsylvania, the horror stories of other states. Should every estate go into probate? No. Um, so depending on how your assets are titled, sometimes there isn't a need for probate. Um, a lot of times if there's no real estate in place, uh, you can avoid probate through beneficiary designations and things like that. Typically, if someone does have a house, though, um, that will go through probate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So Tracy, I have a question from a client who emailed me last night who is on the West Coast and she couldn't be on the call. Um, so she asked me to ask you the following question. She says her mother's been in assisted living now for one and a half years and her brother is in complete control of her finances. Um, her question is, and I'm going to assume they're not too happy with his administration of this, she would like to her and her sister can hold him accountable, and if that's even possible while she's still alive. He has a valid trust. That's what she said. So I, I'm sure you'd have to talk to him specifically, but do you have any comments on that? Yeah, and if this, so this would be Pennsylvania-based. So depending on where mom is, it would depend, it would be based on their laws. But if this was happening in Pennsylvania, essentially you can force an accounting. So she could file a petition with the court that says, you know, brother, I'm questioning what you're doing. I want you to account for all of your actions since you became power of attorney. And then what he would do is essentially submit statements and almost show every penny that's gone in and out of mom's account since he was in control. And then he would have to, you know, validate any ones that seemed a little bit iffy on what they were paying for. You know, so obviously if it's going paid directly to the nursing home or mom goes to a doctor and it's a copay, that's a legitimate expense. But if he's paying some person to, you know, watch the house and they're getting $5,000 a month to do so, that might be something that then the daughter could raise an issue of and actually either have him removed 
um, or and or um, have him forced to pay back some of that money as an improper expense. So whenever you're a power of attorney, your power of attorney is personally liable for actions if they are not in the best interest of the person that they're, you know, controlling the money of. Okay, that's good to know. And mom actually is, so I can uh, maybe connect with her. Great. Any other questions? Are there any other questions, guys? Tracy, do you have anything else you wanted to ask today? Um. I'm trying to think. I would say, like, if anybody has any specific questions that they're not comfortable asking in front of other people, um, my contact information is up on the screen there. Please don't hesitate to give me a call. I offer initial consultations. Um, so if you have any questions or anything that you're, you just don't want to ask to the group, I completely understand that, and I'd be happy to answer them for you privately, too. That's awesome, Tracy. Um, so I... I think that was super informative. And if you don't have any other comments, um, I just want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to do this, educate our clients on some of these matters. I know that you are absolutely open to touching base with people and talking to them about, you know, any legal questions that they might have um, and even offering a consultation if they are interested. There's so much more. I know then what you talked about today, and it is really very specific to each person's wants and needs of their financial situation. But um, to let everybody know, um, we after these calls, we typically send out an email with the replay, but also we're going to attach um, Stacey's PowerPoint as well as her contact information in case anyone would like to call her. I know that none of our clients procrastinate about this. <laughs> they already all have all of their ducks in a row when it comes to their estate plan, but there may be a straggler or two that's on the phone that might need to give you a call. So, uh, but we will definitely do that. And um, I think we really appreciate your time and you doing this. It's been an excellent job kind of giving us an overview of these things. So, no, thank, that, thank you. I'm sorry. I said thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, before we wrap here, everyone, I just wanted to remind you of a couple things. We will be sending out that um, correspondence as a follow-up to this. Also, we're going to be sending out some additional correspondence this week. You know, um, some tennis plans for our reopening. Um, we are going into the green phase, and that doesn't mean that everything's back to normal, but we're going to um, be sending out two things. One is a reopening questionnaire to get some input from all of our clients. But two, we're just going to give you an update on how things are going at the office, um, who's working from home still, you know, what's happening at the office. And, of course, we'll do our Fun Friday email as well. And we're going to continue to do these webinars um, on a weekly basis and continue to provide you informative um, you know, uh, information about different topics, not just market updates. So I want to thank everybody for uh, being so wonderful to work with uh, again during this time and also let you know that we're open to suggestions if there's any way that we could be more helpful to you or if you feel like we could be adding value during this time, please let us know if there's a topic specifically that interests you that you'd like us to feature. Uh, but we're here for you when you need us. And uh, please give Tracy a call or me a call if you have any questions, and I can always direct you to her or coordinate with you. So, Tracy, thanks again for everything. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the meeting here in a moment. And uh, everyone be safe, be healthy, and hello, Green. Hopefully we'll be able to start leaving our houses soon. So um, looking forward to seeing everyone in person soon. All right. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye.